All right, if you sing along with us, shine, Jesus, shine. Here we go. Thank you. 
If I survey all the good things that come to me from above, if I count all the blessings from the storehouse of love, I'd simply ask for the favor of him beyond. Upon the 
Good morning, Beach Bluff Baptist Church family. Uh, you know, I'm so glad that you're here uh, this morning. And, and even if you aren't a member of Beach Bluff Baptist Church, I'm glad that you're watching anyways. I hope the Lord has a, a special blessing for you this morning uh, that can be found in his word here this morning. And so just glad that you're here with us uh, here this morning. So this morning we're going to be looking and we're going to be continuing on the, the, the verse that I've been walking through the last couple of weeks and I'll be talking about uh, to this morning. And, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And in this verse, it, it speaks about that, that. And then there are these faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. In the first week, we, we learned and we talked about how faith is absolutely foundational to our relationship with Christ. And that without faith in Christ, there is no relationship with Christ. Without faith in Christ, there is no, there is no salvation through Christ that you must put your, all of your trust, all of your faith, all of who you are in Christ Jesus. That's what we're called to with, with, uh, with the salvation that he offers us. We must put our faith in in Christ Jesus. And actually that faith is what drives every aspect of our life. Every conversation that we have. Every, every, every place that we go. Everything that we do is driven by the faith we have in Christ Jesus. And so you have faith and then you take hope and you stack it on top of faith. Because as your faith increases, your hope also increases. Because as your faith increases and you look at God's word and you read God's word and you know that God's word is true and it is truthful in every aspect, then you also realize that, you know what? His promises are also true, that, that the promises of the of the eternity that he offers us is true. The promises that that one day will shed this, this earthly body and will gain the glorification that we so desire, and you know, that will be true. We understand that, that, that God is waiting. God the Father up in heaven is waiting for us to come into his presence and worship him and, and just have a wonderful time up in heaven. We all know that's true. As our faith increases, so our hope also increases. Our faith in Christ Jesus. Our hope in Christ Jesus. But it also says, but the greatest of these is love. Then how do we know that it's the greatest is love? How do we know that it's not faith? How do we know that it's not hope? Well, one thing that we can know and one thing that we can realize is the love that God has for us is, is the core of both faith and hope. That without faith in, in God, then, then or without the love of God, there can't be any of the faith in God. Without the love of God, there can't be a hope in a God. You know, without God loving us, in offering his son up for, for our salvation, there's nothing to have faith in. There's nothing to have hope in. And we're, we're just lost. But God has loved us. God has, you know, just has this amazing, remarkable plan for us, for you and for me. And so we know that the greatest of these is love. And so that's what I want us to talk about here today is God's love for us. God's love for us. And, and real quick, I just want to say this. You know, so many times we generically talk about how God loves us. And, and we just, we use the generic God term, which is okay. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But I want us to also understand that it's not just Jesus who loves us, but it's God the Father who loves us. It's God the Holy Spirit that loves us. God the Father has loved us from the very beginning of all of eternity. Him with, with, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit at the creation of the world, at the creation of the earth and the universe and everything in it. He has had a plan for us from the very beginning. And in that plan, he, is, he has loved us and pursued us. And up until this day, right now, and all for eternity, God the Father's plan has been to love his people. And so not only is it Jesus that loves us, but it's God the Father who loves us and God the Holy Spirit who loves us. Now you may sit there and say, well, what do you mean God the Holy Spirit loves us? How does the Holy Spirit love us? Well, the Holy Spirit's job when it is to work on our lives. The Holy Spirit's job is to come into our lives and to direct us, to train us, to show us the right way to do things. 
That's the job of the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ, He comes in and resides in us as a seal for eternity, and He works on us. Now, I don't know about you, but, but you know, if someone doesn't care about us, then they don't care about us getting any better. But God shows his love for us. God, the Holy Spirit, shows his love for us because he wants the very best for us. And so this morning, I want us to talk about how God loves us and how it makes a difference in our lives. Let me pray for us here this morning. Dear Lord, I just thank you. Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you so much for the wisdom that it has in its pages. Lord, that it is alive, sharper than, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and Lord, it's amazing what your word can do to our lives. It's amazing how you can mold us and shape us into the person that you want us to be. Father God, I just thank you so much for all that you do for us. Lord, I thank you for who you are in our lives. Lord, you are so good. And I thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning I want us to look at the story of the triumphal entry. Because today is Palm Sunday. Okay? And in Palm Sunday, you've got to talk about the triumphal entry. And, you know, I'm so sad that the, uh, that the children's church isn't here. Because I know for a fact that, that whoever did children's church, uh, they, the kids would come out with palms. Whether they're given palms or made palms or whether they colored palms or talk about palms, whatever it is, okay, I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a law that, that in church on, on Palm Sunday, the kids must come out with a palm in their hand. But it is Palm Sunday, and so I want us to look in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is starting in verse 35. Luke 19 starting in verse 35. <clears throat> And in, on, in, in uh, verse 35, it says this. It's talking about that, that Jesus sent his disciples into the town ahead of time to get a donkey and to bring back to him. And it was amazing. It was just like Jesus said it was going to be. And so when they brought the donkey back, they said uh, in verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on, on the road. When he came near to the place where the road goes down to the Mount Olives, uh, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You know, you know it was finally time for Jesus to come into Jerusalem. It was finally time for Jesus to come in as the conquering king. And, you know, for you and for me, we finally look at the story and say, well, it's about time. It's about time that Jesus gets what's due him. It's about time that he comes in as the king of kings and as the Lord of lords. And he comes in and people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they just are cheering him on and, and yelling for him and putting their cloaks and, and other stuff and palm branches and whatever it is. They laid it on the ground so that he could come in as the conquering king. He was celebrated by the people. He was celebrated by the disciples that were around him. And they were screaming and yelling for them. People came from all over to praise him because they knew he was the Messiah. Because they had, they had seen the miracles that he had performed. They praised him so much that, that they were hushed. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was six years old, you know, I, I would get hushed. Uh, maybe I was in the library and I spoke too loud. Shh, hush. But I'll tell you this right now. That at age 43, being hushed is not one of my favorite things to have happen to me. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it's one of the things that makes my skin crawl, you know, to be hushed. You know, and, I, and you're probably the same way. You're an adult just like I am, most of you that are watching. That, that you know what, you, you hear someone say, shh. You're like, oh, no, they did not. No, they did not. It's kind of like me telling my wife to calm down. Bad move, okay? Doesn't help the situation. But, but the, the disciples were, were hushed. It says here in verse 39, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And I love it in verse 40, but Jesus' response was, it says this, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Man, it's one of my favorite places in Scripture. That, that if they stay quiet, the stones 
would start to, to yell, start to cheer, start to, to praise God. You know, that, that reminds me so much of today and what's going on and what's happening here today. That, you know, what the, the world tells the church, hey, you can't meet you know, and I understand that I'm not, I'm not, you know, kicking back on that at all. I understand we gotta, we gotta make sure that we protect people and keep people safe. But it's so funny that that when when the church is told to be quiet, it's amazing how many places church actually happens. That there's church happening in living rooms all over the country, all over the world here today on Palm Sunday. That people are worshiping the Lord from their houses, from their cars, in parking lots, on loudspeakers, wherever they can hear it. They're hearing it here this morning. I love it. Shh. Oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't shush me. Don't shush us. Don't shush the church. Because if we stop, the stones would then praise the Lord here this morning. I love it. I love it. We all... <clears throat> And so <clears throat> we have Jesus coming into the town and he's celebrated. They're screaming, they're yelling. It's awesome. It's wonderful. It's a great scene. <clears throat> but then something happens. Something happens on Jesus' way down that road. <clears throat> In verse 41, it says this. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he, he looked from, from the mountainside and he looked down on Jerusalem and he saw it and he wept for Jerusalem. You see, there are so many places in Scripture <clears throat> where it talks about God loving us, God loving the world, Jesus loving us, and Jesus loving the world. You know, you have the, you have the story of how he turned water into wine so that he could love his mother that she, so she wouldn't be ostracized because she wouldn't get in trouble in that situation. We see the miracles that he performed, feeding the people, uh, the masses, with just fish, a couple of fishes and some loaves. We see him healing the lame and the sick that are out there. We see that, that he protected the weak and loved those who couldn't, couldn't defend themselves. The woman at the well uh, and then the children. When they tried to keep the children away, he said, don't, don't, don't keep those kids away from me. Bring them in here. When you look at the gospel, you will find so many places uh, that, that point and that say how much Jesus loved the world. And how much God loved the world through Jesus uh, and, the, and the people that he came in contact with. And so in verse 41 where he says Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and he, and, 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 and he was stopped by a thought. I don't know what exactly that thought was. I don't know what stopped him to, to, to what, what forced him to stop and to look at Jerusalem. But he did. He stopped and he looked down. And he wept. For Jerusalem. He wept for the people. The people of God are missing out on their inheritance. The people, people thought that the land and the kingdom was their inheritance. And what Jesus was weeping over was the fact that those people down in Jerusalem, they're not getting it. Those people down in Jerusalem, they're not understanding about who I am, that I'm the Messiah. I am their inheritance. I am the person that will bring to them what they've been waiting for, what they've been celebrating for generations and generations. I am that person and they're not getting it. And he looks down there and he weeps. And he weeps for the people of, of Jerusalem. He weeps for those who don't get it, who are, are not understanding about the Messiah. He weeps for those who he understands the consequences that are coming for those people. He understands that if those people don't put their faith and their hope in, into him, then they, they will suffer eternal, eternal punishment for that for that, for that non-understanding, for the lack of understanding that they have. He understands that. And he sits up there and he weeps for this town because they don't understand. I love this verse because it shows that Jesus loves the world. He doesn't just love his people. He doesn't just love his disciples. He doesn't just love those who, 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 who have faith in him and who put their hope in him. He doesn't just love those people, but he loves the world. 
Because those people that are down there in Jerusalem, those were the lost. Those are the ones that are about to scream, crucify him, crucify him. Those are the people down there in Jerusalem. And Jesus is weeping over those people. Jesus is looking down at the people that are about to beat him. He's looking down at the people that are about to do horrible things to him. And he's weeping over the fact that they are missing out on what they've always wanted to have. A relationship with the Messiah. And the salvation that that Messiah brings. You know, there's so many times that we see that Jesus loves the, 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 the people. That, that, that he, he loves those who, who uh, you know, he leaves the 99 to chase after the one. And, and we see those stories. But man, this brings it home to me that he looks down and he just weeps for those people. He weeps because he knows the consequences of, their, of their, their lack of faith and their lack of hope that they have. <clears throat> my question this, and what, what this brings to my mind, is when was the last time you wept for the lost? I mean, we love in church to talk about how much we love people. We love to talk about how much we care for our neighbors and love our neighbors and everything like that. My question is this, do you love them like Jesus loves them? Because if you love them like Jesus loves them, you'll weep for the lost. You'll weep for those who, who, who don't have faith in Christ Jesus. You won't ostracize them. You won't look at them and say, oh, they need to stay over there. We will meet in the church. They can go over there and we'll be over here. The non-believers and the believers, let's separate them out. Because, you know, they're, hey, they made the decision. They're on their own. If we love them the way that, that Christ loves them, we would weep for those who are lost. We will weep for those who, who don't have a relationship with them. You see, Jesus' love for the people, and when I mean the people, I'm talking about everybody on earth. Jesus' love transcends all levels of society. Jesus' love is bigger than, than just one set of people. He loved the rich and he loved the poor. He loved the Israelites and he loved the Samaritans. He loved the old and he loved the young. He loved anybody, whoever you were and whatever you did, he loved them. The greatest is love. The greatest is love. That's what it says, right? In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he said, but the greatest of these is love. You know, to put it even a better way, if you back up from 1 Corinthians 13, 13, all the way back up to 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it says this. It says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Before it starts talking about love and before it starts talking about how we are to treat people and before it starts talking about the way that God has loved us and the way that we are to love others, it says, now I will show you the most excellent way. And what that means is this, when in doubt... Love like Jesus loves. The most excellent way means this. When in doubt, you love people the way that God's word tells you to love them. That you love the people around you the way that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says to love them. I know we talk about this all at weddings. You know, 1 Corinthians 13. Oh, it's the wedding things. Oh, it's the love things. And we sit there and make it out to be only about a romantic love. It, doesn't, it has nothing to do with romance. This is the way that we are to love our fellow human beings. This is the way that we are to love the people around us. If you want to know how to love like Christ loved, look at chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love like Jesus loves. When in doubt, love like Jesus loves. Because that's the most excellent way. Having faith in Jesus is great. Having hope in Jesus is wonderful. But you know what the most excellent way is? Is to love like Jesus loved. Because that's putting your faith and your hope into practice. That's taking what you have faith in, what you have hope in, and living your life out to, to the people around you. To love in the most excellent way. Love like Jesus loves. You may say, well, how is that? How does Jesus love? He loves unconditionally. That means he loves everyone. 
No matter what you look like, no matter where, where you are, it doesn't matter. He loves unconditionally. He loves everyone. You may sit there and say, well, how can Jesus love me? How, how can Jesus love me? You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. I've, I've done terrible things in my life. There's no way. The, the amount of sin that's stacked up in my life is so big and so enormous. There's no way that the Savior can love me. Well, I'm here to tell you to say, to tell you this morning, that is absolutely false. Because let me, let me just ask you this question. Have you ever hit Jesus? Have you ever beat Jesus so bad that you ripped the flesh off of his bones? Have you ever done that to Jesus? Have you ever looked Jesus straight in the face and cold cocked him across the chin? Have you ever, yeah, have you ever sat there while Jesus was dying up to the cross and, and taken some dice and rolled it and, and, and played games for the clothes of the Messiah? Have you ever done that? When you said, said, well, no, I've never done that. That's terrible. That's horrible. He wept for those people. Because he loved those people. So don't tell me that you're someplace where God can't love you. Don't tell me that you've gone too far that God can't love you. Don't tell me that you've seen too much that God can't love you because it's just not true. God loves every single person out there. God reaches out his hand to every single person out there and says, you know what? I've loved you so much that I've, I've pursued you. I've loved you so much that I've sent my son. I loved you so much that I sent you the Holy Spirit to live in you. This is what I do. And Jesus is saying, I've been with you since the beginning of time. And I love you so much that I, that I didn't, didn't want to stay in heaven, that I came down to, to earth to walk amongst you to die a horrible death so that you can have forgiveness and you can have salvation. That's how much I've loved you and I promise you that I'll be with you forever and ever and ever. I shall never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise that Jesus says to you. And the Holy Spirit says, I'll come as a seal for your, for your future glory. And I will live with you and I'll teach you and I'll, I'll show you the best way that you can live your life. And I'm here for you and I want the very best for your life. And this is how I love you. And, and so you look at this and you say, my goodness, how could you ever say that God can't love you? God has loved you. And he loves you today. And he's going to love you tomorrow. The question isn't whether he loves you. The question is, do you love him? Because that's what it takes, is you loving Him. There is no question that He loves you. But do you love Him? Do you put your faith, your hope, and your love all into the Savior, Jesus Christ? But we are to love like Jesus loves, unconditionally, to everybody around us. It doesn't matter who they are, what they've done. We are to love them. And you may say, wait a second, what do you, mean? you mean if there's a murderer here, I should love them? Yes, that's right. Love them. I'm not saying you got to hang out with them every day, but I am saying you better love them. What about people that don't think like me? What about people that don't act like me? Yes, you love them. I'm not saying you have to be BFF with them. I'm just saying you got to love them, respect them, treat them nicely, care for them. That's what we're called to do. We also need to love humbly, which means this. God has loved us humbly, which means this, that He's put us before himself. We look at the life of Christ here on earth. A man, you know, he didn't live in any mansions. He didn't live in anything. He didn't even have a house. He didn't even have a chariot, man. He walked everywhere that he goes. He loved us by putting us first in our ability to have a relationship with him. So to love others like Christ loved us means that we need to put others before us. Man, one of the things that have come out of this tragedy and all the stuff that goes on in here, it's amazing some of the stories you hear. It's amazing some of the terrible stories, but it's also amazing to hear some of the wonderful stories. Stories of people in grocery stores giving up their toilet paper so that someone else can have it. Someone saying, you know what, you need this more than I do, so you go ahead and have this. Or, or going and shopping for somebody else because they don't want to get out of the house or they can't get out of the house. All these different stories that are happening here, you may have to search for them, but they're out there. 
loving humbly by putting others in front of themselves. And love like Jesus loved means that you love completely. You may say, what, what do you mean by loving completely? It means love as much as you can, as long as you can, to as many people as you can do it to. Let me say that again. Loving completely means love as much as you can, as long as you can, and for as many people as you can do it to. Because that's the greatest and the most excellent way. It's to love the way that Christ loves us. Love the way that God has loved us from the very beginning until now and for all of eternity. That we are to love him that we are to love others the way that he has loved us and we are to love him the way that he has loved us unconditionally, humbly, and completely. I don't know where you are here today. You may be watching this and, and, and know that you are good to go. Know that you have a relationship with Christ and that, that it is a growing relationship and every single day it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's fantastic. Or maybe you're sitting there today saying, I don't have a relationship with him. I've, I've never known that God could love me that way. Well, I'm here to tell you that he can and that he does and that he always will. And so if you need to talk, if, if you need to make a decision, you know, if, if you need to, to start a relationship with Christ, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. What it means is this. If you want to start a relationship with Christ, like I said before, you start by putting your faith in him, taking it off of yourself and putting it on him, because Christ is the only way that you can gain salvation. Christ is the only way that you can be forgiven. Put your faith in Christ Jesus. Start with that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just start walking you through that. Give me a call. My number is 731-298-1626. 731-298-1626. Call me, text me, do whatever. If you've made a decision or, or anything, you know, if you've come to a realization in your life and you need to talk to somebody, call me, email me, do whatever it is. Look at our Facebook page. You, you can find me, text me, message me, whatever. Let's have a conversation about your relationship with Christ. You know, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love the way that God has loved us so that we can go and love others. Let me pray for us here tonight. Dear Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you so much for loving us. Lord, I thank you so much for, for, for sending your son down to die on the cross, to be buried, and then three days later to, raise, to rise again for our salvation, that we can put a fa our, our faith in something bigger than us. Lord, that we can put our faith in something that will not change. We can put our faith into something that, that has eternal consequences. Lord, I thank you for the salvation that your son brings. Lord, you are so good. I thank you so much for all that you do for us. I thank you for who you are in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a great week. God bless you. Know that I love you. If I can help anybody in any way, please give me a call and let me know. Thank you very much and have a great, great week. Be blessed and be a blessing to other people.